So I don't know about you, but I love a great road trip. I've always loved road tripping. I'll never forget it uh, when I was graduated college, I was gonna be moving out to the West Coast from my home state of New Jersey and uh, me and my buddy Ilya were gonna be uh, driving together. And I remember it was time for us to go and we were loaded up the van and the U-Haul. And then we were just standing out in front of Ilya's house and we were just talking. And at some point, I don't know if it was my dad or Ilya's mom, someone was like, hey, you guys are gonna be in the car together for a while. Why don't you take your story on the road with you? And I don't know if they just wanted to get rid of us or if it was, they were just really aware of the fact that we, were gonna, we had a long distance to travel and we were gonna spend a lot of time together. Now, the reason I bring this up is normally I have a great story for you all, but we're gonna travel a long distance today in the book of Revelation. So can we just jump in together? Does that sound good for everybody? Okay, we're gonna be talking a lot today. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. We're gonna be picking up in verse 14. And the reason we're doing that is because I didn't finish chapter 14 last week. And so we'll pick up where we left off. Open your Bibles, last book in there. If you didn't bring your Bibles with you to church today, there's Bibles on the seats in front of you. Or, um, you know, pull out your, your phone. It's probably already out there. You're checking the scores. You're checking your social media. You're watching your cryptocurrency crash and in real time, so sorry. Don't watch it. It's happening either way. I shouldn't even make jokes. Okay, jumping right on in. Revelation chapter 14, picking up in verse 14, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on that cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Verse 17, then another came out, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar, who had power over the fire, and he cried out with a loud voice, and he said to him with the sharp sickle, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to a horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. Now, in the context of all of this, if you remember, there's, we're in this parenthesis right before the, the bowl judgments. And really what we see here, and this is so important, is that, my friends, that there's going to be a great harvest one day. What we learn is that at some point, like, like you have to think of yourself as not only yourself and our, and our world, but we have to think of like we're, we're all designed for fruit bearing. And all through the scriptures, there's this idea that God wants each one of us to bear fruit. We have like things like the fruit of the spirit. But the reason that is, is because at some point there is going to be this great harvest. And at that point, then we're going to be harvested for the fruit that we have. And so in these verses, verses 14 to 16 and then verses 17 to 20, it really tells of these reapings of these harvests. Now, if you notice, there's two different harvests. And what's fascinating about it is uh, in the first harvest, it looks literally talks about how the grapes are, 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 uh, are ripe, the harvest of the earth is ripe, and then in the second harvest, it talks about how the grapes are fully ripe, or some would say that it's actually overripe. But what we realize is that there is a harvest that is coming, and all of us are going to give an account for the fruitfulness of our lives, and that's really what we're seeing here. This reminds me of Jesus in Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29, where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the full grain of the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And so what you find is that in the last days, there will be a time when the harvest of the earth is going to be reaped, that the fruitfulness of our lives is going to be seen for what they are. And I realize that we don't often don't like hearing this, but listen, we all have to give an account for who we are and how we roll through the world. 
And, and not, that's not only true on the social level. Like, like if you treat people poorly, it would make sense that people don't wanna be around you, right? And, and if you treat people well, then it would make sense that you know, people might wanna be around you. But what we really have to realize is that ultimately all of our lives are gonna be weighed in the balances whether we like it or not. And to give an account for who we are. And really what we see is we see this, this telling of, hey, listen, there is a harvest that is coming and you have these, these angels who are literally in the midst of doing this work of harvesting. Look at verse 15, it says, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap. So he went out and he thrust a sickle into the earth and it was time for harvest. See, so, so there's a timing for all of this. And in the same way, in the second reaping, now if you have a little uh, subheadings in your Bible, mine before verse 14 says reaping the earth's harvest. And then in the second one, verse 17, it says reaping the grapes of wrath. Because it is interesting that in the, in the second reaping, of course, we find that, I remember I mentioned that they're overripe, but it says here that the angel, verse 19, thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trampled outside the city that blood came up out of the wine press up to the horse's bridle for 1,000 and 600 furlongs. So really what they're saying is, is that this second reaping, and really most people would say this is the reaping of those destined for destruction, you have blood coming out of this wine press four feet high and about 1,600 furlongs, literally it's a stadia in the Greek, which would be the equivalent of about, about over 180 miles. So you realize that this is a very provocative image. And, and ultimately when you land in this kind of an image, people all the time say, well, I don't know why would God want to judge the world? Like, like it doesn't just make God mean, right? Isn't that like the normal question? The number of times people say, I, I, how can I believe in a God who would judge the world? I wanna answer that question for you, but I actually wanna let the next chapter answer it for us because we learn how you would not want to believe or worship a God who wouldn't bring judgment because what we're gonna find is that God's judgment is righteous and just. It's the right thing. And I know that sounds challenging, but look at what it says. If we move on to, to chapter 15, look at what it says. This is chapter 15. It says, then I saw another angel in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them the wrath of God is complete. Verse two, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God almighty. Just and true are your ways, O king of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. After these things, verse 5, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came seven angels having seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with a golden band. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So really what we see here is that in response to this reaping, and really we see this is now the prelude to the seven final judgments, the bold judgments. What we find here is that the response in heaven is a response of worship. And really what I would say for us is that we wanna be filled with praise and glory because of who God is. Now I know someone's gonna say, be filled with glory. What does that mean? I'm gonna show you in a second. But if you look at this text, what you have is in response to this reaping, right away there is this praise that erupts in heaven. There's, there's this seven angels and, and they have the seven last plagues for in it, it says that the wrath of God is complete. It's fulfilled. These seven final judgments in the book of Revelation and God's wrath will be complete. But he sees this sea of glass mingled with fire. 
So, so for John, it evokes the sea, but he realizes it's not water, it's glass. And he sees these, this image of fire, and on those are those who had victory over the beast and over his mark and over his image. So we see almost this redeemed group of people who are coming out of this time of great trouble, the last days, and they're there, and, and they begin, and they have the harps of God. So if you ever wonder why the cartoons always have people in heaven playing the harps, you know, God's down with the stringed instruments. I'm hoping my harp will be a... A fender bass, but that's a different discussion for another day. But they, but they have, they have their, their and, and they sing, it says they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb. Now, of course, the song of Moses, if you want to just make a little bit of a, a note in your Bible, go back and read Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, which you really have this, the song of the deliverance of the people out of Egypt. They call it the song of Moses. And also, if you want, make also a note of, of Deuteronomy 32, which is a song that was personally written by Moses. Now, it's funny, I, I love uh, Christian scholars because they're smart, and uh, really almost all academic scholarship is based on argument. It's like, well, one person has this position, someone has this position, and they argue about it. And, and, that's, and listen, don't get me wrong. We wanna, if we argue, we want to argue in a way that's constructive and not destructive. But a lot of our great thinking comes through when we have disagreement about things and we're trying to work the thing out. So it's funny to watch scholars argue about is the song of Moses that they're talking about here in Revelation 15, is it actually Deuteron is it Exodus uh, 15 or Deuteronomy 32? And uh, you can read volumes on this. People have all the reasons why. I just write them both down, read them both. They're the word of God, and we're going to keep going. Does that make sense? So, so, so they have this song. It's the song of Moses. But, but you have to think, for, the, for these folks who are singing this song, just like the children of Israel were delivered with a great deliverance out of Egypt, now you have this group who's also delivered with a great deliverance out of this time, which is the, the, the winding down of all things with the Antichrist. And so really what it teaches us, remember I said we should be filled with praise when God God delivers us, whether it's us, our understanding of his deliverance for us from our sin by saving us, or when God brings us through something that is challenging and hard, our heart's response should always be to praise him, to worship him. The number of times I have caught myself praying for something, God does something, and I am like the leper who was healed who never went back to say thank you. I catch myself doing that all the time. And so I'm trying to train myself that when I say, God, will you help me? Lord, will you get me that job? Lord, will you open that door? And then that door opens. My job is to come back and say, Lord, you heard my prayer and you acted. You worked. And really what we find is for these folks who are singing this, what's called the song of Moses and the song of the lamb, they're praising God because they went through some terribly hard things, but God has taken care of them. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. You want your life to be filled with praise. I mean, how many of us, we have so much to be grateful for. And I'm not saying that everything is easy. And I'm definitely not saying that everything has worked out the way that we wanted it to. But we're still here, aren't we? Like while, while there's breath in our lungs, you have reason to praise. Right? And, and, so, and, and, and so often it's, you can clap if you want. That's so... Gratitude is a choice, my friends, isn't it? It's a choice. It's like, given what we're seeing, do we respond with a heart that says, God, thank you for today. God, thank you for this moment. Lord, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Right? That's a choice that we make. And it's a decision of the will in light of what you're seeing to say, I'm going to make sure I do not neglect the very reality that God is God and God is good, even though I have to go through hard things. And so they respond with the, they sing the song of Moses and the song of the land. Now, this song is beautiful because it really boils us down to really like uh, four things. Now, I didn't come up with this. I just pulled it out of a commentary somewhere. Um, and so I don't know who, because I didn't attribute it. So I'm just going to tell you, I got four W's for you. So you know I didn't make it up. I'm not that alliterative. But really the praise is for God, for his work, because his work is great and marvelous, right? For his ways, because his ways are just and true. For his worth, he deserves fear and glory, for he's the only one who's holy. And then of course, his worship, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifest. Now, I think this is very powerful because really they're praising God for the things he's done, his works, his ways, the way God moves through the world, 
his worth because God, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? It's a rhetorical question. It's like everyone should because he's God, right? And then, of course, he deserves worship. But all the nations praise God because of his judgments. They're saying all the nations, all the peoples of all the nations, they praise God because of these judgments that he's bringing to pass. Why? Because his judgment is just. Now, it's amazing. So you have this praise of the multitude. And then it says in verse 5, after these things, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in bright linen and having their chest girded with a golden band. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now, you might, if you don't know the Old Testament, you might not catch all the references here. But really what you have is if you read the book of Exodus, most people get hung up because by the time you get to the end of the book of Exodus, you find first God gives Moses like all, like all the, the, the architectural schematics for the tabernacle, which became the temple. Like down to like this big, this is what I want it to be made of. And then you get all these chapters of them actually building it to spec, doing exactly what they were supposed to do. And all the time when people read it, it's like, why are we reading this? By the time you get into the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and the writer to the Hebrews tells us that really what God gave to them is almost a copy of what's in the heavenlies. So what you find is after these seven angels come on out of, of, of the temple, then there is this, they're given these seven bowls of the wrath of God. And they're coming out in white robes with their chest girded with a golden band, which was the way the priests were dressed, right? And then all of a sudden the tabernacle, in the heavenly tabernacle fills with smoke. And if you remember, remember when Solomon ded dedicated the temple? What happened? The visible presence of God, what they call the Shekinah glory, fell on the temple. There was smoke everywhere. And really what you have is with the ushering in of these last judgments now, the heavenly tabernacle is filled with smoke. It's, it's filled with the visible presence of the glory of God. Remember I said we want to be filled with praise and what? And glory. Of course, we know that Jesus is God's temple, right? Right? And guess what, you know, you are the temple of God as well. And so really what this is reminding us is that we want our lives to be filled with we're praising God because of his deliverance. But your life should be an example of the visible presence of the glory of God. And, th and this is why, my friends, this is why who we are matters, how we live matters. Because people should see there is something about that person in their life. There, there is this, this, this gloriousness of what it means to be in Christ. I always think, remember, uh, the Apostle Paul talks, remember how Moses, he'd come out of the tabernacle and he would cover his face because his face was shiny? Like he, he had the light of Christ. But really what's, but what's amazing is, is the Apostle Paul makes the point that the reason Moses covered his face is because the glory was diminishing. But really what he's saying is that for the child of God who knows Jesus, that glory should never diminish because Jesus dwells within us. What would it look like for you to say, Lord, I want my life to be a place that's filled with your glory, my countenance, who I am, how I move through the world. See, what we're learning here is the heavenly tabernacle is filled with the glory of God. And John sees it. And no one's allowed to go in until this is all done. Now, as we move on in now to Revelation 16. See, we're, we're making pretty good ground here, right? We're, we're on our journey together, our little road trip. I just want to say right now, everyone on staff did not think I'd make it into Revelation 16. So everyone on staff, ha <laughs> ha. I got 15 minutes, ha <laughs> ha. Can you give our staff a round of applause? They had to put up with me all the time. I had some of our pastors were coming up there giving me a hard time before the service. Like, hey, we do want to get lunch at some point before dinner today, Pastor Daniel. They didn't think we're getting there. I'm here. All right. Let's slow down and relax. Let's go into the right lane. 
<laughs> verse, I'm just kidding. Verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Verse 2. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Verse 3, then the second angel poured out the bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature of the sea died. Verse 4, then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. And then I heard an angel of the waters saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. Now, the only thing I can really say about this is that the bowl judgments are awful. Like, th this, is, this is the end of it. This is, like, th like, this is the climax of the wrath and the judgment of God. And so it's these seven bold judgments. And literally, it starts by saying, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And then it begins. So the first bowl, they pour out the bowl upon the earth, and it says, a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men. So really what you have here is you have these painful, these injurious, harmful sores come upon people. And now, of course, this is reminiscent of the sixth plague in Exodus. So remember I talked about this, that in a lot of ways, the plagues of the last days, the judgment of the last days, there, there's a mirror oftentimes to the way God judged Pharaoh and Egypt. And you can read about this in Exodus chapter 9, uh, verses 8 to 12, which is the, the sixth plague of Egypt. Now, I, I didn't need to make the point because, you know, people all the time get, uh, you know, all bent out of shape over uh, gender-inclusive language. When it says, pour it on men, it means men and women too. So one time, nobody complained about gender inclusive language in the Bible. It's like, oh man, the guys got it good, you know? But no, it's like, sorry, it's, it's the people. The people get this thing, okay? At, you see how I just did that? I just did that for fun. Sorry. <laughs> but, but what's amazing is, is these sores only come upon those who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Now, don't miss that. Remember I told you, like we saw that, that there was the people who received the mark, right? And they worshiped the image and there were those who did not and they were sealed by God. But what's amazing is, is they got the mark of the beast and then you get the, you get the consequences of that decision. And you have to realize, listen, people all the time say, you know, what's really hard is like, you know, there's a, there's a consequence to following Jesus. You're right. There's also a consequence to not following Jesus. And we have to realize that every decision you make, there are consequences that come from it. Not all of them are wonderful. Things are hard. And, and there's, on this side of heaven, nothing, everything is imperfect. So you're always making choice. I was just talking to a couple, a couple weeks ago. And, you know, a young couple, and they're falling in love. And they're like, man, you know, one of them was like, hey, it's like it's scary, like, to make that decision. I'm like, yeah, it is. It is scary. It's a step of faith to get married. You know, like you fall in love, you don't know how it's going to work out. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. But what's amazing is, is that if you choose to get married, then that's one set of things and there's outcomes to that. And if you choose not to, then there's other things that go on, right? And you, there's a million movies about the people who, you know, should have gotten married and they didn't, you know. And, oh, we, we missed the boat. And then they wish for their whole life wishing. And then the movies, they always meet them again later and they fall in love and it's happily ever after until the movie when they don't like each other anymore and then they refine their love. You know how movies work. Like they find you the falling in love journey and then after they, they don't love each other and they fall back in love again. That's how it all works in, in, in the movies. But you have to realize that it might, you might feel like it's hard to follow Jesus in this day and age. But I'm here to tell you, it's way harder not to follow Jesus in this day and age. 
Because the benefits of knowing God and walking with him, the benefits of knowing that your God is a good God changes everything and the fact that he is changing you as you go. So I, I say that because I think there are some people now, there's a lot of pressure today. I remember when I came to know Jesus, I love my friends to death. They're like, what are you doing? Like, cause like we, we just didn't know any Christians. And so it was like, what, what are you doing? Like, this is crazy. Don't do that. But I look back on now, I'm so grateful that I didn't listen to my friends and I just followed Jesus. And did things change? Yes. Was it always easy? No. Do I look back on and wish I'd made a different decision? Definitely not. And I believe that there's some of you right now, God is doing a work. He's been drawing you in. But there's that part of you right now that you're like, man, I don't know, like, like things are gonna change. And I'm here to tell you, you want things to change. And I'm here to tell you that if you ch follow Jesus, there are outcomes that come to that, but they're, they're good outcomes. Because here it's like you find like, for the people who got the mark, they were able to buy and sell, but now when, when, when the first bowl gets poured out, that mark's a lousy thing. Now, just, just a reminder, this is not about the COVID vaccine. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, I know none of you in here think that this is about the mark of the beast. But there are people who used to go here who think this is about the mark of the beast. That's not what this is about. All right? It, this is, it, it's coming out of a golden bowl from heaven, people. Come on. Like, think about it. I need to say that, though, because some people come up with all these things. Like, oh, you. So I shouldn't have gone there. I, now I feel bad. Actually, I don't really. I'm sorry. I want to feel bad. But what you realize is for the people who took the mark, it got easier, but now it's way worse. Does that make sense? And so one of the things that I like to tell people, and I wrote about it in my book, You're Going to Make It, that really biblical grit and resilience is continuing to do the right things the right way for the right reasons, no matter the cost. Right? And sometimes doing the right things the right way for the right reasons, it costs a lot. But in the long run, it's the best option. Because for the people who took the mark and they worshiped the image, they got to buy and sell for a little bit. And now they got painful sores all over their bodies. They're, like they're under the, the, the wrath and the judgment of God. And so it was a terrible decision thinking in the long term. Now, not only do you have that, by the time you get to the second bowl, it says, then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. And so now you have all of the, the, the salt water is now turned into blood and not just any blood, but it's literally blood of a dead man. So it's still or stagnant blood. So, you know, one of the things when liquid is moving, it's ways, it's ways different than when it's stagnant and still. And so of course, all of the living creatures in the sea ultimately die. Now this is reminiscent of uh, what began in the second trumpet of, of Revelation chapter eight, and then also the first plague of the book of Exodus, where right away the, 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 the salt waters became blood and everything within it dies, right? So again, now, now we're seeing the, the fulfillment of all that has going on. Now judgment is coming. You get to the third bowl, and now instead of it being the salt waters, now it's the, the spring waters, it's the fresh water, right? Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Now, again, we saw this in the third trumpet judgment, Revelation 8, 10, and 11. And again, we already talked about the first plague in, in, in the Exodus account, uh, Exodus 7. Now, you think about this. You have, people have sores. Anyone who's got the marks got sores. And now there's literally no clean water, right? All, all the animals of their sea are gone, now listen, if you're environmentally uh, conscious, and I think you should be, because don't ever miss the fact, environmentalism is not a political issue, it's a biblical issue. Go back and read the creation account. God gave his creation to Adam to steward it. See, this is why, this is why I always struggle with American politics, because people think politically before they think biblically. If you're a Christian, you're biblical first. Your politics follows on from that, right? Read the creation account. Adam gives an account for the way he stewards God's creation, which God's creation is full of his glory, shows his eternal power and godhoodness. So as Christians, we should care about the environment, not as a political issue, but as an act of stewardship because we worship the creator God. Amen? So if you're environmentally conscious, you should want to believe in Jesus because by not believing in Jesus, ultimately everything in all the waters is going to get turned to blood and everything's going to die. 
So the extinction event has everything to do with not believing in Jesus. Now, we shouldn't pollute the environment and all that stuff. That's a big, much different discussion, right? Biblical ethics on these things. But the reality is, is if you care about the environment, believing in Jesus is the best thing that you can do. Because those who don't believe in Jesus are actually the precursors. This is why this happens. And in the midst of all this, all the waters are blood, everything is dying, and then there's a praise break in the middle of this. Doesn't that strike anybody as strange? It's like God's pouring out judgment, and there's this praise break, and it says, And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was, verse 5, and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Wow. So that this... This angel of the waters literally says, God, you are righteous in doing this. Why? Because they martyred the people of God, spilled their blood, and now you're giving them their just due. Wow. See, now, here's what I want you to take away from that, my friends. And I know that this can be a little bit challenging, but you have to realize that what, as it relates to God's justice and God's judgments, we struggle with it because we actually think that we are just and righteous. But I'm here to tell you, the Bible tells us, is there any one of us who is righteous? No. It literally says, there are none who are righteous, no, not one. In case some of us are like, well, maybe I'm kind of all right. Now listen. So what we realize is that the way we judge things is faulty. But God who is righteous and holy, the way he judges things is right. And in heaven, we'll realize, oh, Lord, that's why that had to be that way. And that's one of the things that I do. People all the time say, Daniel, what do you do with this part of the Bible? And you read these things, you're like, man, it's hard. I'm like, what I realize is that God is righteous and I am not. God is holy and I am not. At best, I am righteous and holy because I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And he has shared his holiness and righteousness with me. But not for one second do I think that I think everything with the mind of Christ and I understand exactly what God is doing. So I realize that when I get to heaven... I'm going to be like, God knew exactly what he was doing. His judgments are perfect. And then what I also realize is that the way I would have judged things would have been totally wrong. Does that make sense? So God is praised for his justice in what he's doing. And then that's funny, and verse 7, and another angel from the altar saying, even so, Lord, O God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So out of the mouth of two or three heavenly witnesses, all things are established. So God is just. Now you get to the fourth bowl. Look what happens. Then the fourth bowl, fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, verse 8, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So really what you have now, now this is... Men being hurt with fire, this is reminiscent of the sixth trumpet judgment. We saw that in Revelation 9, 17. But really what you have is now all of a sudden, you notice it, the bowl is poured on the sun. So whether it's something with our ozone layer where now all of a sudden the, the heat of the sun, whether the, 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 it hits us differently and now we're being burned by the sun, right? What you realize is that this is a time of great struggle. And what you have is that people are now being hurt by the very thing that warms and keeps our earth safe, the sun. But what's interesting is their response, because in verse 9, what you find is they were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power of these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now, you see what's going on here. As always in the scripture, when things happen, God wants us to turn from the way we're going and turn back to God, Right? And, and, and praise him for what he's done. But what happens oftentimes is when we're hard-hearted, things are going on and it's showing us, I need to, like, this is going bad. I need to turn back to the Lord. But instead of doing that, we get stiff-necked and we keep running and we start blaspheming God. This is a normal human response that is the height of folly. So I, I say this because I think there's, uh, there's no doubt in a church like Crossroads, people online, in the house, in all different places, like nobody asked you what you were doing last night or last week, but I'm pretty sure that there's a number of you right now, you are making some really horrible decisions and you know it, and you're starting to get, you're starting to get, you're starting to get in trouble for it. And what God wants you to do is he wants you to repent and turn to him. And don't be like, no, no, I'm going to do it my way. Because if you keep going down the road you're going, it's going to land in a bad spot. It's going to land in a spot that you would have wished that you had turned earlier. And I, I just say that as, as a warning because 
God is a loving God and he will continue to try and get our attention and turn us back until the point when he says, they're just gonna keep going, it doesn't matter. And then he just gives you over, then he stops that pursuit. Oftentimes God's judgment, he gives you exactly what you want. You just don't realize how poor of a decision it is. So if that's you and you're like, if you're like, oh, that's me right now, your job is at the end of the service when we give an opportunity to put your faith and trust in Jesus or recommit your life, your job is to come down. And whatever it is that you're doing, you know you're not supposed to be doing, you know it's not God's will, you know God has something better, and you know that it's all starting to come out and that it's going bad, there's gonna be a harvest that's gonna be bad for you. Your job is to repent and turn away from that and stop that right now. You cut that thing off. You cut it off. That's the only way to deal with it. Because you wonder for these folks who are getting burned by fire, what would have happened had they not blasphemed God, but they repented and said, God, forgive us. But that's not the story that we get here. And then, of course, by the time you get to the, the fifth bowl, the fifth angel, verse 10, poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So the fifth bowl is darkness that can be felt. It's so painful that they literally are gnawing off their tongues. That's how horrendous this is. Now, of course, the, this idea of, um, you know, the darkness, we saw this, the fifth trumpet judgment, Revelation 9-2, darkness that can be felt, that's the ninth plague of exodus before the death of the firstborn. So all this ties in here together. But again, the, the response of the folks are not to turn to God. The response is to continue to blaspheme God. And even though there, there's sores, there's scorched down there, there's pain that can be felt, all this stuff, but they're not repenting of what they're doing. They're just continuing down the road. Now, really what we find, we have the sixth and seventh bowl. And, and really what we're going to see is that, and really the principle of this is you need to make the final preparations. Because the sixth and the seventh bowl is actually the final preparation for the return of Jesus. So look at what it says in verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and his water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame and they gather them together at a place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So what's interesting is the sixth angel pours out his bowl and really what it does is it dries up the, the river Euphrates, which of course you find in uh, the book of Genesis. It's one of the rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden, right? And so, and really the idea is it's the preparation because it dries up this river. So now that the, the army of the kings of the east uh, can, can make their way to this final battle. What's interesting is then, then he sees these frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophets. Now, if I, if I had like the gift of animation, I'd be like, you know, animating this and stuff like this. Because it's just, it's super interesting. Like, you know, if you're a creative person, you know, if you can do, uh, if you can draw really good, you should do this. I should have Annabelle do it. I'll show it to you next week. She'd have a great picture of this whole thing, you know. But, but really, of course, the, the plague of frogs you know, we, we see that in the book of Exodus. It's the second Egyptian plague. But, but this is not actual frogs. This is all, it's, it's a spirit of demons that are coming out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan, the, the beast, which is the antichrist and the false prophet. And really it's going to, to draw people, to draw people to this great battle that's going to happen, this, this last day's battle, right? And what's interesting is in the midst of all of this, you get the words of Jesus. Behold, I'm coming as a thief, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. So Jesus is saying, I'm coming like a thief. I'm coming at an hour you don't expect. Of course, that reminds us of Matthew 24, verses 43 to 44. But know this, that if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. 
And he's saying, look, I'm, I'm coming in an hour you don't expect. And then you have this, the next beatitude of the book of Revelation. So, it, like, this is also practical. Oh, how happy, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So really the idea here is the person is blessed who realizes that Jesus' return is unexpected and they're prepared for it. It reminds us of the, the virgins who had the oil in their lamp waiting for the bridegroom. There's so many pictures of this in the scripture. Are you ready for the Lord's return? Are you living in such a way? So that's why I, I love following Jesus because you, you're reminded, of course, that you need to keep short accounts, that life, like, like tomorrow's not promised. Jesus could come back today. The number of times I wake up every morning, I'm like, today could be the last day. I could be driving, something could happen. All of a sudden it's my time to go. You just don't know what's gonna happen. So as followers of Jesus, we live our lives prepared. If today is my last day, do the people that I love know that I love them? Am I following Jesus? Am I taking care of business? If Jesus, if that trumpet sounds today, I don't wanna feel like I left something undone. I don't wanna feel like, hey, I didn't proclaim the gospel, right? We wanna live in that state, that, that ready state to be able to go at any time because you just never quite know when the day's coming. It says verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. You know, it's amazing. Bruce Willis isn't at Armageddon. I always use him as my favorite. But now we have to talk about Chris Pratt. He's like the new Bruce Willis, right? He's the one who saves everything all the time. You know, if you know movies at all. Armageddon is a place. And we'll talk about it more. But look what it says, verse 17. The seventh bowl. Then the seventh angel poured out the bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake that had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found, and the great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. See, well, by the time you get to the seventh bowl, all of the earth is shaken. I mean, really what's going on here, th this will be a natural disaster unlike anything anyone has ever seen. It says it'll be the greatest earthquake that has ever occurred on the earth, so much so that every island is gone. So get your Hawaii trip in, your Caribbean trip in now. You know, all the mountains are gone. So take your pictures of Mount Hood, St. Helens. It's like, it's like the earthquake is gonna be so severe that all the islands will be gone, all the mountains will be gone. And then not only that, it's like, it's bad enough. We find that the great cities divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. So you're gonna have buildings are gonna be falling all over the place. And then the great Babylon was remembered. We're gonna see the destruction of Babylon, seven, chapter 17 and 18 going forward. And then to make matters worse, then there'll be hundred pound hailstones falling from the sky. This is some gnarly business, isn't it? So what do we do with it? It's really simple what we do with it. We believe in Jesus. And we live our lives in such a way that even people who don't believe in Jesus will be interested in Jesus by the way that we live our lives. See, we don't read this and we don't say to ourselves, man, this is all gonna go, you know, you guys are all gonna get destroyed. Good. Like we don't have that kind of a heart. We have a heart that says we want everyone to know Jesus. It's why we do the over and above offering. It's why we are on the TV, on the radio. It's why we are inviting people. We have billboards all over the county. It's why as a church family, we are serving in our community and we're serving across the globe. It's why we do everything that we do here as a church family, because we realize that God is a good and gracious God and God is long suffering. 
But at some point, there is a day coming yet future when God's long suffering is over. It's time for him to fix what is broken. And when we look at what it looks like for that to happen, we see destruction and pain and we see hard heartedness. And we say to ourselves, long before we get there, we wanna be people who are with Jesus trying to repair that breach. And I'm here to tell you, a church is only as good as the family. Like, we need good leadership. We're trying our best. But I'm here to tell you, who we are as a church is who we all are collectively. And what I want to encourage you as I bring this road trip message to a close is I want to encourage you to say, Jesus, will you turn up my spiritual temperature? Will your spirit come and change me, transform me. Lord, will you help me to press into you? Lord, what do you want to do in my life in this season? How do you want me to live, Lord? Who should I be praying for, Lord? How do you want me to amend my ways? If you've been doing our through the Bible reading plan as a church, we just finished, we just started at Ezekiel, right? But we went through Jeremiah and Lamentations. Tough sledding. Right? Jeremiah's message was, you need to amend your ways. That means you got to change. And on every page of Jeremiah's prophecies, I'm sitting before the Lord, I'm saying, Lord, change me. Because I don't want to say, I'm a pastor, I love Jesus, but I know that there's things that God wants to change in me, how I respond to things, how I think about things, how I look at things, right? I come and say, Lord, will you, will you amend my life? Will you change me? And I'm here to tell you, listen, all of us need to be changed by Jesus. No matter how long we've been walking with Jesus, not one of us is all the way there. Not one of us is in every way, in, in, in every thought and motivation and action and intention. Not one of us is there. So no matter how long we've been walking with Jesus, there's always, this is the next thing he wants to do in my life. This is the next step he wants me to take. This is how Jesus is inviting me to simply respond to him to be more like him. And what I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, is just say yes to Jesus. Just say, Lord, your will be done in my life. And if we do that, not only will our lives be filled with praise and glory, but our lives will be, for lack of a better word, our lives will be leveraged by God to participate with him in his kingdom. Where Jesus reigns on this earth in our families and in our neighborhoods and in our jobs in our community and in our world. So I just say, Lord, your will be done in my life. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your grace. I thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for the fact that you care about our lives. Lord, we want, we want at the harvest, we want our lives to be full of good and precious fruit, the fruit of righteousness and joy and peace and love. And we want our lives to be fruitful so that you might be glorified and others might be nourished. And Lord, as we see the bold judgments, they're, it's nasty, Lord. And Lord, we just want everyone to know you. We want everyone to be with you. We want, we, want the, we want the, for lack of a better idea, we want the bus going to heaven to be overflowing with people. We want a, we want a bigger bus, Lord. Lord. We want to take everyone with us. And Lord, we ask that you would raise the spiritual temperature in our lives. Do what you want to do in us. That we might be a witness in this generation of what it means for us to, to know you, to walk with you. Lord, amend our ways. Lord, we know that the revival you wanna bring, it needs to start in the house of God so that it can never touch outside. It begins in my house, the Fusco home, in the house of my brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask for a revival.